All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and, and, and thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike said, I'm Frank Ackerman. I'm the Executive Director for Buildings and Properties at the clinic. I've been there about eight years, uh, came to the clinic uh, from the military. I did 29 years in the Navy and retired as a, as a Navy captain. In the Navy, I was responsible for real estate planning, design, construction, facilities, operation, and maintenance, and that's exactly what, a, what I do at the clinic. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, I am humbled to have the opportunity to serve uh, in the healthcare profession. Uh, if you're ever having a bad day, if you're ever having a bad day, go to the pediatric ward and you will count your blessings. Um, it is one of those things when you have an opportunity to interact with a patient or their family member and provide them comfort or take care of something that they need, uh, it is worth all of the pain and suffering that we as facility managers go through taking care of the plant. The clinic was founded in 1921 by four doctors who came off of the battlefields of World War I. They developed a model of practice in the MASH unit, in the tent, to act as a unit where all the specialists came together to take care of the wounded soldier. And they brought that to Cleveland and established a staff organization. First patient, February 28, 1921, actually right on this site. Today, the clinic has over 50,000 employees, and including our Abu Dhabi facilities, 32 million square feet, 4,000 docks, we're in four countries, three states. It's ranked number two in the country. So when Mike reached out to me to talk about innovation, I gladly accept it, because innovation is in the lifeblood of the clinic. In fact, being an academic medical center, their mission is to provide better care of the sick, to investigate their problems, and to educate those who serve. So, how many of you know what this is? Take a guess. So, a morgue? Close? Gross Anatomy Lab. Thank you very much. All right. So this talk is about innovation, and I want you to remember this picture because it will come back. Okay? Okay, innovation is in the lifeblood of the clinic, so much so that in the year 2000, we actually created, on campus, an innovation center. Now, the building you see right there, which is the Global Cardiovascular Innovation Center, was only built about 10 years ago. But 17 years ago, we started the whole practice of taking ideas from the physicians. And we have MDs, PhDs, and guys and gals that are MDs and PhDs from their research side, from the academic side, and running that through the pipeline to go from idea to actual product or patent. And as you can see across the top, we use the word invent to go from idea to translation. Just the breakdown, the output of this, as you can see about 50% of them are medical devices, 22% therapeutics, 23% IT, and 5% really in that, that delivery of healthcare. Now what's interesting, is on healthcare IT, and everybody has made fun of the IT world while we're here this week in terms of the cost, is in that building I showed you a little bit ago, we started several years ago with a little company called Explorers. They had 12 people doing healthcare IT, just working, it's all they did was work on their computers. And they kept growing, and they kept growing. We had to move them out of the building. And we moved them down to another place on campus, and they kept growing, kept growing. They literally had to move off campus because they were reaching 300 employees. They're doing the big data part of healthcare innovation. We work with partners, academic partners and institutions and other healthcare systems on the left. We have professional development partners there in the middle that we work with and market partners on the right. One of the things, and everybody kind of thought Google Glass was dead, is working through innovations is we're bringing these back and we're going to try a test here. You know how much time a doctor spends on the EMR relative to the time they spend with a patient? Sometimes it's two to one. 
Sometimes it's two to one. And doctors are spending, I mean, literally like 15 minutes with a patient and then the 30 minutes to bring all the records up to date. Using this device, we can have somebody in the background, not a doctor, but a scribe, who can then scribe in real time to allow the doctor to spend more time with the patient or see more patients and practice at what we call the top of their license. Having the doctor scribe is not practicing at the top of their license. And so one of the ways we're trying to reduce the cost of healthcare, one of the ways we're trying to improve the throughput capacity of our facilities is to have everybody from the nurse to the doctor practice at the top of their license. We have so much innovation. In fact, we have an annual innovation conference. This was just two weeks ago. 2,600 people attended the conference. It was held down at the Globe, the convention center in Cleveland. And we publish as part of this, and you can go online and Google this, the top 10 innovations, clinical innovations of the year. This is focused on clinical innovations. And as you can see, the number one innovation that came out is called the hybrid closed loop insulin delivery system. And I read about that this morning, and I wouldn't even try to explain it to you. But it's really cool. And this is the type of things that we work with. And as we go into healthcare reform, and we look at different ways to deliver health care, it's these type of people, these MDs, these PhDs, who are coming to the table saying, we can do it differently. So, one of the things that we're wrestling with is the speed of knowledge or information in the healthcare side. Today, the amount of information you need to know to be a doctor doubles every 73 days. It's, it's, it's all, you can't do it. You can't do it. And that was talked about both last night and this morning. So we're partnering with IBM Watson. And the joke is, the bumper sticker is, IBM Watson goes to, to med school, to help us develop that artificial intelligence that allows that physician or physician assistant to speed up the diagnosis and bracket it down a little bit so that they can make the proper diagnosis the first time. And I mentioned that group called Explorers that started with 12 and went to 300 and then went to downtown Cleveland. Well, they're back. This building is on our campus. We're actually we'll finished construction this month. And we're going to bring them back to the campus because there's the value of having those coders and those analysts on the campus interacting with the docs and the nurses in real time as they look at the data, look at the patient outcomes. And we think that this is one of the major, the best investments we have made at the clinic in years. So, changing gears a little bit. There's a lot of drivers out there that are forcing the clinicians to make change and to innovate, and us as well. You heard Kip this morning, you heard everybody talk about the Affordable Care Act. So let's start talking a little bit about what that might mean to us. And I'm not going to talk about all the charts and everything you've seen. I want to show you some of the stuff that we're actually seeing today. As you would expect, the number of outpatient visits is going up, right? We're going from inpatient care to outpatient care. The demand for access and the expectation of, I want it now, is going up. And we're trying to accommodate that. We think that we'll get over a million visits this year, same day. You call in the morning, and I am in today. And so that's changing the dynamics a little bit about how we serve our customers, both in volume, capacity, location, and the types of services. In fact, we're building a family health center here in Lakewood. And what we're seeing is, when we analyze the market, the primary care service area, is we're closing an inpatient facility and shifting it all to this outpatient facility. We're going from 480,000 square feet to 62,000 square feet in the community. But this facility here, very, very dense, focused on primary care and family medicine. It has an ED, imaging, and the rest of it is primary care and family medicine. But you would, let me back up a second, I apologize. You would think, though, based on the numbers you saw, is that we actually need to build more square footage because on the outpatient side. But here's something we're seeing. And the numbers are small, but shared appointments is causing us to have to rethink our facilities. Because you can't have two or three people in an exam room. You need a conference room. You need a classroom. Or maybe you need a kitchen because you're going to teach them about diabetes and how to eat better, or how to manage their weight, or how to manage their stress. So this is a precursor of things to do and things to come as we try to grow without growing square footage. 
increase our throughput. The other thing we're seeing is a big demand for express care. The data, and I just, it's the first time I've ever seen our ED volume plateau and go down. With all healthcare reform, policies, Medicaid expansion, we've, our volume in the EDs was going up, going up, going up, and the ED guys said, we gotta build more, gotta build more. But finally, finally, just, just this month, the curve bends, bends a little bit. And the reason is, folks are using Express Care, which is much cheaper, and we're putting this out in the community. We're putting this in malls. We're putting one in downtown Cleveland. Now, an Express Care can have a couple things. It can be three or 4,000 square feet, or it could be 8,000 if you put a little primary care, but a much, much smaller than an ED. So here's an Express Care in downtown Cleveland, and we beat everybody else to the market here because everybody's moving down down Cleveland, and we put that in October 31st of last year. Now, so why, why is this innovative? Well, on my side, I had to do a couple things. The business plan, the margin on express care is about as close to zero as you can get. And so the directive I was given was first, location, location, location. And second was, you gotta have an ROI less than five years. So what we did is we actually hired a real estate guy from CVS who understood location, location, location in the Minute Clinic, and he has helped us pick the right locations and pick the right markets. We've hired a real estate lawyer to put in the real estate department to negotiate that lease faster and understand how do we get out, because if I can't return the investment in five years, what do I do? We developed lease standards, and then we developed an acquisition strategy called the job order contract. For any of you that have worked with the Department of Defense, NASA, or GSA may know this, where you have contractors who basically are under contract to you on a pre-priced book. You walk in, you measure everything, you do a set of plans and specs just to get your permit, and they can give you a price in 24 hours and you go to work. Because speed to market here is critical, absolutely critical. But at the same time, you need to be ready to walk away in five years. And why is that? Because Express Care Online means you don't even have to go there. Our CFO and our strategy folks are saying, guys, if you build that for 20 years, you're gonna run us in the ditch. You need to develop a design and an acquisition and a costing strategy that says in five years I'm making money, and if I need to walk away, that's okay, because if the, mar if the market changes. Now, a lot of discussions at all the tables this week, there's been talk about distance care, home care, and things like that. Well, express care is actually a subset of distance care, distance health, and so, here is the use per month of, of distance health, and all of our institute chairs actually get graded every quarter on how they're improving the use of distance health within their institute. So let's talk about what that is. So you have two types of distance health. You have the synchronous and the asynchronous. So when you look at the left-hand side of that slide, I want you to review it real close. Outpatient, got it? Inpatient. We actually use distance health to take care of inpatients. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. We use distance health to augment the ICUs. And of course we do virtual visits. On the asynchronous, that's really the chronic long-term care that's monitoring that we're doing, the remote monitoring and watching trends using wearable devices. So here's the, here's the matrix that kind of covers all that and just take a few seconds. Virtual visits, the synchronous care, there's, there's real interaction. Somebody's looking at you, you're looking at them, you're talking to them, you're going back and forth. That's real time. The asynchronous is data gathering and watching trends and then acting on it. We also do a thing called e-visits for those common ailments. So you, really, you really don't need to see a doctor at all. If, if you have lower back pain, you know, 99 times out of 100 is take an NSAID, stretch, do a little therapy, you'll be fine. You don't need an MRI, you don't need, a cat, you don't, you don't need any of that. If it persists, and then we'll move on. But that's trying to reduce the cost of healthcare by keeping them out of the hospital. Chronic disease management, that's at asynchronous. And so here are the wearable devices that we're experimenting with. And we built the hospital called Avon Hospital. We called it the hospital of the future from scratch. And that was the vision when we designed it, was this to get the patients out of the hospital and get them home using this technology. And so we're watching that length of stay go down, and we're watching the, um, the, the return, the less than 30 days also go down. 
So I talked about inpatient virtual visits a little bit on that synchronous. So staffing is an issue. You think about, we have 4,000 beds across Northeast Ohio. We have some of the highest case mix index in the country. And so one of the things we're challenged with is the availability of intensivists. And you start thinking about how many intensivists you would need across the system to cover all those beds 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So what we've come up with is a system where we use on-site intensivists in a command center that are monitoring our patients remotely. So here are our major hospitals where we have ICU units across the system. And you can see, in most cases, except for the main campus, we only have intensivists there about half the day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. roughly. But by setting up a command center that can then monitor remotely using technology, we can provide near 24-hour coverage. And so here's a bunker that we started setting up, and it was so successful that we actually had to double it in size to cover the other hospitals. And then we also did the same thing on telemetry. So what they do on telemetry, and we talked about this actually yesterday a little bit, was each patient has a, a profile, what their heart rate is, what their blood pressure is, and all their ailments and stuff, and they program the algorithm that when you get outside of an acceptable band, that's when the alarm goes off. And so the intensivist is watching this panel here, and you look on the right how many patients they're monitoring, and when it goes red, that patient is outside of the profile. And so that's what draws their attention. And they have it set up now. He drags it to the other screen, and he can see exactly what's going on. And if necessary, call the nurse and say, you need to go to room 12. That patient's in trouble. Okay? So that's required us, as the facility guys, to design interactive patient rooms. So in this case here, and you can't see it, I didn't have a very good picture, is the TV on the right-hand side there has a camera that is so sophisticated the intensivist can actually see how dilated the patient's eyes are. That's how that remote monitoring goes. All right? So think about that, what the physicians are doing. So what are we doing as facility managers and leaders to raise the bar and reduce costs? So we've set up an enterprise command center that will look at all our facilities across the system from a BAS perspective. We have over a million data points across the system. This is an early version of it. We're building a new one to expand it. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And what these guys are doing, among other things, is watching our 260 ORs. They watch temperature, they watch, watch pressure, and they watch humidity, and they watch the diff pressure differential. You can see that one up there is red because it's unoccupied. So what we do when it's unoccupied, it's already programmed through EPIC to spin down from 20 air changes an hour to six. So they're watching the setbacks. But I can tell you, that ORs have gotten much, much more sophisticated. It used to be you had one device in there, one sensor, and if you were in regs, you were good. But this is a transplant OR, and they're in there for 12 to 14 hours. And the doctors would call up, the surgeon would call up and say, you've got to turn the temperature down, you've got to turn it down. And our sensor, which was off in the corner by the door or whatever, said, you're fine. I can't turn it down. I'm going to go outside of the ASHRAE 170 rules. Well. Here's what we did in this one here, and you can see how many sensors we put in the room because what we learned, what we learned working with the surgeons and putting this many sensors in, the air came down, hit the top of the lights, and then went out. And under the lights where all the action was going on was 20 degrees warmer. So using that technology, we now what we do is, one, is we had to redirect the flow of the air, and we actually put like fins at the lights so it goes down and then we monitor closely. And we haven't actually haven't had a complaint since we did that. Everybody's done BMS, BAS for years, right? That's nothing new. The guys have gotten very, very sophisticated, though, where they start watching whole floors at a time. Our buildings are all interconnected with skyways and controlling 11 million square feet, so you can imagine what that turns into cubic feet, at one time is very difficult. But using Niagara Tritium and a building logic system, they're watching how the buildings perform. They've taken that to a new level. So this is our main campus. And what they've done here is they've got enough devices in the buildings, and they've pro figured out how a building should perform and how much energy it should consume on a certain day, whether it's ORs, research, or admin. And if a building is green, the building is performing as it should. If it's red, something's wrong. The building's consuming more energy than it should. Now, you may be looking at the other dashboard and everything's right because all the ORs are balanced and everything, but the building's struggling. 
So you see those two red buildings there at the top of the screen. Those are both research laboratories. So what's that tell you? All the hoods are up, and it's just sucking everything out of the building. So we're able to go down there and actually draw to their attention a behavior issue. Now, we're working to change those hoods out so they're automatically shut down when the guy walks away. But that's how we're taking this technology, saying it's not just being in compliance, it's being in compliance and being efficient and using that data. In the same vein, our security guys have done the same thing. The highest cost in security is the guard. He or she walking around seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You have the opioid crisis. You have gangs. You have all sorts of issues at the ED, but you also have the issues on the units. And so our security team developed a strategy to come up with a command center, much like we did on the BAS side. We just activated it in September, and it brings all that together. And so using technology, they actually have better coverage across the system, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, still have the police officer in the ED at the magnetometer, but we provide better coverage in, in the um, parking lots, et cetera. And because we're international, We've now had to roll that out across four countries. BAS, uh, of course, has been around forever, as has CMS, as has BIM. But one of the things we all wrestle with is that transition from how do I go from construction completion to operation and maintenance? And here's your manuals. And so we challenged ourselves on the cancer building to not do this. We talked to a lot of people about BIM FM and said, who has done BIM-FM? We had a lot of folks say, yeah, I've done BIM-FM, but we never really found anybody that began with the end in mind. Literally began mapping the process from the day you started design and then continuing it beyond completion. So when we started this pilot, this is what it looked like at the Cleveland Clinic. As you can see, we had dropped off all the manuals and we dropped off all the drawings, but nothing else happened. Nothing got into CMS. And the reason is, the construction guys think different than the facility guys. The construction guys all go by the division, but the facility guys, I'm a plumbing shop, I'm an HVAC shop, you give it to me that way. And so this did, we realized this disconnect, so we started building the process literally from the get-go by asking a question, what is BFM? And this is what it is. It's a practice of creating, beginning with the end in mind. All right, so this is where we started went through everything, and then this is, this is where we ended. So the Cancer Center's been online since March, and, I can, and I have, there's a video in here, and I won't show it to you. But I can tell you that employees, this is the first time they've ever done it, where they literally, and folks talk about the iPhone, it is actually working, and it's working very, very well. So you guys have heard of GPOs, right? Group Purchasing Office. Works in supply chain, take a lot of cost out. So we have one at the clinic. These, these folks are amazing. I am stunned by what they do. So under the same pressure to reduce cost, we said, why can't we do that in construction? We didn't set up a GPO, but we did an experiment. We had three large projects coming down the pike, 600 million, almost exact same timeline, and we said, why don't we challenge the trades and the CMs to reduce cost? First thing we did is we said, what if we reduce your retention? What if we go paperless? And what if I pay you in 15 days? It's all electronic, right? And you're a good team. Second is, I grouped all of the air handling units, all of the chillers, all of the sheet rocks, all the metal studs, and we went out and bought those single at one time as a purchase. And the third thing I did, I said, I'm going to get you bid on each job, and if you get all three jobs, do you give me a better price? And the answer was yes. And so we saved $9 million. It's a small percentage, small percentage. But remember this morning, the discussion, I think Lee was up here talking about if that $9 million then allows me to go do five other things. Okay, getting near the end. Cleveland Clinic, talked about we're four countries. One of the countries that we're starting to delve into is London, UK, Great Britain. And so I think if you guys study this picture a little bit, you can, you can see that house across there, that humble abode, Buckingham Palace. Well, there's where we're building a hospital. Uh, those tower cranes are ours, and what we're doing is we're literally going to demolish the building inside, do a facade retention. There's an underground parking garage in this building. We'll go all the way down and take it out. We'll prop up the walls, build a whole new foundation system and piles to align to the new column lines for an inpatient facility, and we'll build it back up 
205 beds, 305,000 building gross square feet, eight ORs, and we just got our general contract tender on Friday night, and we're working through that. And then we have a, a, a MOB that we'll build up near Harrods. So why do, I, why do I share this with you? Well, everybody talks, and I think the next brief actually is, is about, uh, 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 what is it, uh, pre-manufacturing, et cetera. This whole building, because it is complete, there is absolutely no lay-down area. The entire inside of this building will be prefabricated off-site and shipped into, literally. So you can see on the left the facade retention, where they're gonna hold up the sides. We literally are gonna remove the entire building. Off on the right is, is the Envision final product. And you can see there, we're precasting the columns. The slabs, the walls, the head walls, and what they call the off suites, the bathrooms. Put the whole thing together, they're gonna to prefab the entire mechanical plant on the roof, and the roof itself, crane it in and turn it over. And there's the benefits. All right, health education campus. One of the things we've done, I said, is you know, we educate those who serve. So Case Western has a school of medicine. Cleveland Clinic actually has the Learner College of Medicine. You go for free, there's no tuition. We accept 32 students a year. It's ranked number four in the country. Dr. Cosgrove and Dr. Snyder, the president of uh, Case Western, came together and said we should build a joint med school. And it started out as just their med school and our med school. And then we said, hey, the, the, the future of healthcare is act as a unit, reduce costs, get everybody work together. So we brought in the School of Dental Medicine from Case and the School of Nursing. So we brought these four colleges together. And so we're working, we'll open up in, uh, we're gonna finish in the spring of 19, first student is July of 19. 485,000 square feet, and you can put the Parthenon in the atrium. You can put the Parthenon in the atrium. Now, you saw this picture before. So why is that relevant? Case Western uses embalmed cadavers. Cleveland Clinic uses frozen cadavers. If you have a med school, I now have to handle embalmed cadavers and frozen cadavers, and if you've ever been in an anatomy lab with embalmed cadavers, the air handling unit cost is staggering, staggering. So the challenge, the challenge we were given was build me a med school without cadavers. Video, please. The HoloLens is absolutely the most amazing piece of technology. Within five seconds, I realized that the world had changed. It was an immediate realization that this is something exciting and we have to be a part of this. Seeing things in 3D is something that you could do before with some glasses. The thing that the HoloLens gives you is the ability to walk around those 3D objects and to really experience them as if they're in the room with you. It is augmented reality, it is mixed reality. And what that means is I still see you, I still see this room and everything around me, but the digital content is inserted into the room as if it's actually there. As a teacher, I can see what they're all looking at. And that's something that we think has real power. It's actually opening up our interactions with each other. The biggest drive is getting the anatomy curriculum completely done by the time we move into the new health education campus. Today, we and the Cleveland Clinic are constructing a state of the future health education campus. Our students will learn using the most forward-looking educational programs. HoloLens is a key part of this. The actual act of dissection hasn't changed in generations. We have to be much, much more effective and efficient. The biggest thing about medical school is there's just so much information and so much knowledge you're being asked to learn. HoloLens is going to enable us to teach in an integrated way and to look at the body in ways they haven't been able to see it. It's sort of having x-ray vision, seeing through the skin. My mind was just kind of blown and when I tried it on. It was perfect. It's really hard to understand what the anatomy and folks trying to tell you. So with the HoloLens, we can literally show you what's happening with the body. We can look at how the heart moves or look at how the brain processes information and how information flows around in our brain. They can see when the heart valves are closing and hear the sounds. How the diaphragm moves, when the lungs move. 
A click of the fingers is going to allow students to see how everything's interconnected in the body. We have means to draw people's attention to things to get them where they need to look. Do you want to look and then pull the bones out? What they really crave is learning anatomy in the context of what they need to know clinically. What are they going to need to know for their clerkships and their future careers? With HoloLens, we can have essentially any disease that you want to see. So when I see an image like this in the hospital, I know exactly what's going on. This is how to treat and diagnose them. The HoloLens provides like a new way of teaching anatomy. It can really speed up the process of learning this material. I think HoloLens is the next big transformative change in medical education. Hi, I am Maslow. Either step forward into growth or you step backwards into safety. So that complete, completes my, my presentation. If you're in Cleveland next year, please attend the Innovation Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank.